You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Jim Hennick here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today, we're going to talk about teaching philosophy at the oldest seminary in the West, Mount Angel Seminary in Oregon. And of course, we'll explore what's being taught from the classics to the contemporary. Our special and welcome guest is Professor Andrew Cummings. He received his PhD from the University of Leuven in Belgium. His research centers on topics in philosophical theology, metaphysics, and the history of ideas. It comes alive in articles like Don Quixote meets Mr. Gradgrind, a neglected proof for immortality, which appeared a, a while back now in Logos, which is a, a journal of Catholic thought and culture, which I'd like to recommend. And his research brings us into the quest for dialogue with our cultured or not critics. As always, let's begin in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Professor Cummings, Andrew, if we may. Yes. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so, uh, as, you, as you said, I, I teach philosophy here at Mount Angel Seminary. And um, I'm also associate dean here. Um, I, uh, I grew up in England. Uh, my family moved to the United States in 91. And um, so I've, I've always had a bit of a back and forth situation between Europe and America. Um, in terms of philosophy, uh, <clears throat> I actually started off as a history major in college. Um, I kind of turned towards philosophy when I realized that nobody knew what they were doing. And uh, there were no clear answers. I, I found that fascinating. Um, I also found it slightly disturbing, if I'm being honest. Um, but uh, from from that uh, time on, I, I guess I've been bitten by the uh, proverbial philosophical bug. And, uh, and here I am talking to you. Well, that's a... That's a jagged journey, especially given its end point. It was rough. <laughs> uh, Mario, what, what should we, we ask the professor next? Good he's morning. Very, uh, how did you he's come just to... kind of shy. Go ahead, Mario. Don't be shy. <clears throat> how do you come to teach to the seminary or to seminarian, right? Yes. 
Well, um, when I started at Mount Angel Seminary, I was actually in the last stages of my dissertation. And, uh, you know, for, for those who have finished a dissertation, you know, the next panicked move is trying to find employment in academia. Uh, I, I got word from my father who teaches here, he teaches theology here, um, that there was a temporary, a, a one-year sabbatical position opening up. <clears throat> so I, I leaped at that, obviously. And at, it just so happens that at the same time, uh, the American Conference of Catholic Bishops, they, they upped the, level, the number of hours in philosophy that seminarians had to take. Um, from I believe from 26 to 30, which if you think about it, it's phenomenal. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, in some ways I was the, the right man in the right spot. And I, I didn't do enough to tick them off. So uh, I guess they thought better the devil we know. <laughs> so do you realize that you were lucky? Luck's a curious concept. Um, I, I prefer to think of Providence. Well, Mario prefers to think of fate. <laughs> I don't like fate. It always makes me feel like I'm being squished. But uh, I can see the logic. Uh, well, Christopher, let's keep it going. What do you think about... Well, this is not my question, but this is how I put it in there. What do you think about chance? Chance. Uh, I, I, I wonder what that means, really. I, I always find it curious when chance is invoked as some kind of causal explanation and, and what exactly is, uh, is, is given us in, in the way of enlightenment. I don't see very much um, conceptual work being done by chance. Um, I, I get that people talk about it. Um, but, you know, if my house burns down and... Uh, when I ask about what caused it, they say chance. Uh, that's not very helpful. Uh, so, you yeah, know. Yeah. I mean, Aristotle says that chance is precisely that which is uncaused. So I go into the Agora one day to, to buy eggs. You go to, um, I don't know, get your shoes repaired. We happen to meet by chance. There are two right. different causes. So the cause of the meeting, what's the cause of the meeting? Yes, but on the other hand, uh, if you were privileged with a bird's eye perspective or a god's eye perspective, it would not be chance at all. And so things get, the plot thickens a little bit, I think, if you bring God into it. So it's, is it happened by necessity? Does it? Necessity is a curious thing too. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the uh, the intolerable thing that philosophers tend to do, as you well know, is answer questions with questions. But I think some of these some of these topics are, are not exactly uh, shining with light for the understanding. You know. Well, anyway, so I guess would be the real question. Uh, tell us about Mount Angel Seminary, the, um, the Benedictine tradition behind it. Sure, history. Right. Well, <clears throat> um, you know, Mount Angel Seminary uh, goes back to the 19th century. Um, I believe they have a, a sister abbey in, in Switzerland, uh, um, Engelberg, uh, you know, curiously enough, uh, Mountain of Angels. <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, some of them, a group of the monks uh, moved out here and, and they found, uh, I think what they view as their golden mountain. And um, they started the monastery here. Um, but I think, I think you're asking also about um, what practical effect or what kind of an ambiance is here vis-a-vis um, -vis the seminary. And I, I think that there is a, a real difference. Um, the, the Benedictine uh, charism, I suppose you could say, uh, tends to make itself felt here. Um, our abbot right now, uh, Abbot Jeremy Driscoll, talks about the rich ways of the Benedictine tradition, uh, things such as, you know, the, the famous Benedictine hospitality, you know, welcoming all as Christ, the, the, the rhythm of the liturgy of the hours, morning prayer, evening prayer, afternoon prayer, all, all of that kind of thing, um, as well as uh, they call it Lectio Divina, 
but but I think it's helpful to think of a, a sort of a prayerful reading, um, or at least a, a, a spiritually attentive reading. Um, all of this is is commonplace, I think, for the Benedictines, but um, our students, uh, most of them diocesan seminarians, uh, I think that tends to make itself felt in their study and in their lives too. So yes, there's, there's clearly a difference. It, it's not just um, one more college or theology. It's interesting because I, I, I don't know enough about this, but like I, I live near um, the Josephina, the difficult college Josephina. Do you know if the other seminaries, do, they, do the students participate in the Liturgy of the Hours as they might on Angel? Is that... Do, do you mean the students here, of course? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, they, they do morning prayer and evening prayer. Um, and I, they, they tend to join the monks for those. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, the, 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 we, we're, we try to... Um, one thing we don't want is, is an abbey next to the seminary. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not helpful. So, um, yeah, the, the students, uh, as far as we can, we try to... Um, without distracting from their purpose for being here, we try to integrate uh, the life of the monks with what the seminarians are doing here. You said you don't, you would not want an abbey next to a seminary. Why is that? Well, frankly, it's just a little odd uh, having an abbey there, which has nothing at all to do with the seminary that's on the same grounds. Uh, for example, we um, there's a famous library here. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but um, the Alto Library, it's, it's actually quite an impressive architectural piece. Um, beautiful library. And of course, that's used all the time by the monks, but also by our students. Um, we, we prefer not to have the monks and, and our students and faculty and so on side by side, but rather working collaboratively. That's the goal, at least in terms of a vision for the seminary is to have a more seamless kind of integration. Um, so side by side in the sense that uh, each of us is going about our business um, somewhat indifferently to the other. We, we don't want that. You mentioned, uh, Andrew, you mentioned your dad giving you the tip on the job. Yeah. And uh, you wrote a book with him. Think, thinking God. Uh, how, how did that work out, and did, did you come upon any philosophical differences? Well, I, I mean, to begin with, the, the premise of the book was, wouldn't it be interesting if a theologian and a philosopher approached some of the same topics and, and overlapping issues uh, in, in, the same, in the same book? Uh, I found that instructive myself in, in ways I, I couldn't have predicted at the time. Uh, Above all, probably the, the difference between theology proper and, and philosophy. Um, yeah, it was, it, in many ways, it was eye-opening. But in terms of philosophical differences, I, I believe, well, I remember my father telling me I was too, too rational. Uh, <laughs> what he really wanted to say is rationalistic. Um, I think he prefers a more uh, nuanced approach coming at issues from a multi-dimensional perspective. And I see the value of that. Um, but, you know, my in terms of philosophy, which is my own training, um, that was my way. You know, that, that was my way of handling uh, big questions was to... Um, you know, in, 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 you know, hallowed philosophical tradition to, to sort of separate out the issues, to analyze the heck out of them. Uh, that's just how my mind works. So, so there were definitely some differences, but I, I don't see them as necessarily oppositions. Although, I mean, for sure, philosophy and theology, however closely they are uh, structured and, and how they work together, um, they're not doing exactly the same thing. That's for sure. Well, just among ourselves here, no one has ever accused Mario Ramos Reyes of being rationalistic. Mm -hmm. Although, although he has accused us on occasion of that. 
Uh, Mario, what, what would you say if you were asked to mediate the differences here between father and son? I better not to get there. <laughs> um, say something. Yeah. So what I'm curious is that you have an audience in your classes, our seminarian. And anyone outside the Catholic academia would say that's a captive audience. So if you are a philosopher and you are, quote unquote, as your father seems to claim, rationalistic, you may, have, you may want to have a different audience. People who are outside in the world, in this messy world where culture is running amok. And so... Um, what would you say about that? Uh, w your way of teaching, your philosophy, your style, your perspective would change if your audience was different or would remain the same? Or you need to adjust to your uh, seminarian who want to have a, I don't know, a solid doctrinal base for their theology? Well, there are some differences, but I wouldn't want to exaggerate them. Uh, just to take an example, um, for a while, several years ago, I, I taught some adjunct classes at Portland State University. Um, you know, introduction to ethics, uh, introduction to these kinds of things. Um, and I, I didn't radically change my philosophical approach between the two groups. Of course, the, there were differences I couldn't say to my PSU class, let's begin with a prayer. Um, that just wouldn't work. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there was a, at least in, in the case of many students, there was a genuine interest in the so-called big questions. Uh, and that remains the same between, say, the seminary and um, a secular institution. Um, <clears throat> I, I would also say, I, I think it's a mistake to compartmentalize the seminary from the big bad world. I think that most of our diocesan semin seminarians come from the world and they bring with them a lot of presuppositions, prejudices, and, and, and frankly, poor th uh, thinking habits. Um, so in, in a certain sense, you never really get out of the world. And philosophy, I think, tries to respect that. <clears throat> and, and so there is a sense in which um, even the seminarian, I think, finds himself struggling with the same kinds of questions that his peer at, at a secular institution would also be struggling with. You uh, mentioned going back and forth between the United States and Europe. So I don't, I don't know if you were in Europe when that classic detective show Dragnet Oh. was in progress. But uh, those of us who were here, uh, whether in Ohio or in Kansas or California or, or Oregon, we don't forget Detective Joe Friday. And uh, Joe oftentimes said to uh, persons of interest or just uh, possible tipsters, that he was only interested in the facts. He'd say to some garrulous septuagenarian, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And uh, Mr. Gradgrind, who comes to us from Charles Dickens, was certainly interested in the facts. Um, we were wondering with you, just a few minutes ago about chance and fate and luck, uh, should we wonder about whether there are just facts? Well, <clears throat> this is actually, in my opinion, an, an example of the kind of uh, thinking prejudice that comes um, to us today in just right across the board, <clears throat> almost just uh, in the background. 
And I think that whether it's right or wrong, true or false, uh, it's a common assumption today that there's a distinction between facts and values. And if you, uh, if you had to try to, um, to distinguish between them, and, and there was a paper I, I read a while ago by Hillary Putnam, um, which tried to take on this issue, the, the fact value distinction and so on. But uh, if I remember well, the way he put it was that facts are objective, uh, neutral, <clears throat> and capable of some kind of substantiation or proof, whereas values seem to be uh, subjective, biased, you know, you know, perspectival, and actually incapable of proof or substantiation. So the article that I wrote, the one to which you referred, uh, was an attempt to question that assumption and um, to, to look at the changing metaphysical assumptions which enabled, enabled it in the first place. Um, I mean, this is, as, as you know, this is a, a big story. It, it could get, this discussion could get out of hand, but I think that um, the, the point at which we began to assume a fact value distinction was at the breakdown of the Aristotelian worldview, where there was no longer an accepted teleological framework within which values were part of the natural world. Um, instead, we, we, we were presented with a sort of a um, you know, Galileo is, is one of the main uh, examples presented with a world of uh, matter, which, which has no taste or color or smell, uh, operating according to fixed mathematical principles. Um, and, and, and so what do we do with values? Uh, where do they go? Because we, we certainly still speak as though there are values. And so what seems to have happened, uh, and I think there's some consensus on this, is that the values got reconfigured as subjective, perhaps psychological phenomena. Um, and, and this is, uh, this sort of legacy is, is what I think a lot of philosophy is, is still dealing with today. I mean, if you, if you take an, one obvious example would be uh, the case of emotivism. Um, <clears throat> uh, to say that I, uh, I think such and such an action is wrong maybe according to this fact value distinction to say no more than um, I happen to feel a certain way, but that doesn't reflect the way things are out there. Or um, to say you see a beautiful sunset is to say something about what's going on in your psyche, but not necessarily what's out there. All of this is, is I, I think, uh, accepted at large by society, but I think there are historical precedents and, and they can be traced. Now, Christopher Zender uh, has lots of thoughts, both historical, uh, factual, and value-laden. I wonder, Christopher, could you tease out some teaseworthy uh, thoughts here at this point? Well, a question I've been in our discussion, and it's going to we have it will cause us to step back. I'm afraid, um, if you desire to answer it is uh, you were talking about the distinction between uh, theology and philosophy. And I can see there is a, obviously a distinction because the principles of the, of the sciences are different. You know, one starts from revelation, one starts from what, what we know through sense knowledge. You, you talked about your father thinking you too rationalistic and you, you described his approach as, a, I think you described it as a, as a theological approach. I, I'm not quite dis I'm not quite. I'm not quite um, clear because it seems to me that even though the, the sciences start, the two sciences start from different principles. Yet, pretty much the the mode of uh, our mode of thought in dealing in in exploring these sciences is pretty much the same. It would seem to me. I mean, uh, at least we follow Saint Thomas. So maybe you could expound a bit more where you, you think maybe the differences are that you know, maybe reflected in. Uh, your father's judgment of your yep, your hyper rationalism. I'm beginning to think I, I shouldn't have mentioned my father's judgment on me because it's, it's <laughs> on, on the back foot. Um, I, to the best of my understanding, uh, wh what I was trying to get at with the <laughs> uh, as you as you put it, 
is, of course, theology in the traditional sense starts with revelation. Um, that's its first principle. Um, philosophy can start off with revelation, at least if, if it deals with revelation at all, it needs to be sort of in an open, rational manner, um, asking, uh, asking uh, questions from a, a non-privileged perspective, if you want. Um, now, I, I think in regard to the Thomistic paradigm, it's important to remember that prior to the 13th century, <clears throat> there was no St. Thomas, and that the dominant paradigm for Christian thought was Augustinian. And so it's, it's not, I think, necessarily the case that there was one agreed upon methodology right through the millennia. Um, I, I think it's more helpful to, to do something like this, to acknowledge the distinction between uh, where we are in the world and divine revelation as a sort of a starting point. And then look around for what seems to be the most helpful set of philosophical conceptual tools to help us unpack that, understand it. And one of the reasons St. Thomas is so highly honored by the church is that he seems to have done a spectacular job in, in doing just that, in uh, unpacking the meaning of revelation. But if you think, you know, prior to St. Thomas, uh, people like, uh, well, obviously Augustine himself, but St. Anselm and, and, and so on, it, it, you know, these these figures also had a lot to say uh, about Revelation, but their again their dominant paradigm was was less Aristotelian and probably more Neoplatonic. Interesting. I've, I've heard said that Saint Thomas actually is more Neoplatonic than we would think. And um, I mean, even thinking like the whole definition of transubstantiation uses uh, terminology, uses concepts which are at least amenable to a Thomistic mind, right? Um, so it's more, I mean, it's obviously there's a greater elaboration of St. Thomas using using Aristotelianism, but I don't, I don't see quite the same stark difference. I don't see any stark difference in the way of necessarily proceeding um, between, say, Anselm, for instance, or John Damascene or St. Augustine and St. Thomas. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the old stereotype of, you know, Aquinas baptizing Aristotle is, is, is more than misleading. It, it's, yeah. it's not to do credit to Thomas's achievement. Um, it's more helpful, in my opinion, to think of Aquinas as bringing an Aristotelian worldview as a set of concepts to bear on Augustinian Christianity. Um, and it's interesting to note that whenever Aquinas comes to uh, disagree with Augustine, if he ever actually does, he, he treads so carefully. Mm -hmm. He says things such as, uh, what the good Augustine must have meant here is, he'll never just flat out and say Augustine was wrong. And I, I find that interesting um, because on the one hand, it suggests uh, a closer relationship, as you, as you say, between the Aristotelians of the 13th century, or the, at least the Aristotelian inspired figures of the 13th century, uh, and, and what went before. There's not, it's not a cutoff point. Yeah. The road doesn't end, you know, but, but there are differences. And, and um, St. Thomas, uh, I think a very fruitful way of reading him is, is to look at the way, the skill he brings to bear on some of the problems that arise because of the meeting of these paradigms, the Aristotelian and the Augustinian. I thought that Christopher was going to rummage around in the fact value uh, distinction uh, territory, but he has a way of going back and raising questions that he wanted to get at earlier. So I'm, I'm going to go back to the fact value. We'll have to flip and flop here. Uh, thinking of, of Joe Friday wanting just the facts, here are a couple of reflections. If Joe, Detective Friday, were to say, 
just the facts to uh, perhaps a, a witness to a crime or somebody on the neighborhood watch front. And the person said, right, and began counting the threads in the rug, saying, here's fact number one, here's fact number two. Uh, Joe would certainly lose interest in those facts. He's interested in a certain sort of fact. And it seems like the fact that he's interested in is a, a fact that's suggested to him as relevant with respect to some theory he has, or less than a theory, a hypothesis he has about how the crime went down. And so it seems to me that when we talk about facts, we're talking about a certain range of facts, which is selected by something that's less than factual in the grad grind sense. And and then, too, it seems that uh, there are some values which are themselves facts. Uh, John Henry Newman says somewhere in the grammar of assent that if a person wanted to argue that cruelty was a good thing, well, that person really couldn't be argued with. There wouldn't be a, a basis to really argue with such a person. And Elizabeth Anscombe says that if someone ahead of time uh, affirms that it's a, a, a good thing on occasion to kill the innocent, that such a person has a corrupt mind and there's really no point in arguing the fact so the matter is that that person has a corrupt mind. And then, too, there are phenomenological realists. And I'm thinking of von Hildebrand, who would say that there are objective facts that are themselves values that are open to us a kind of phenomenological realism. And there's a, a new book by a fellow named Mark Spencer, who very creatively, constructively, and provocatively tries to work out some sort of a rapprochement between uh, Thomism and phenomenological realism and his point of departure, I think, really, is the fact of the beautiful, the fact of the beautiful. Any thoughts about this convergence and transformation and illumination, at least efforts in such directions of the fact-value distinction? Well, that's, um, there's a lot there. Um, I, I would say, you know, just to continue what I what I said before about this distinction, um, the distinction itself seems to be a curious kind of a fact, um, in other, at least a sociological fact. It, it, it seems to be undeniable that people assume this without even bothering to define their terms or think about what it means. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I think if I understand your question well. Uh, you're moving beyond that and you're moving beyond the historical dimension to this. And you're asking, um, what are we to make of this? I mean, uh, it, does it, does it hold up or is it, um, <clears throat> is it a mistake? I think, I think that, uh, it's, well, obviously I, th I think it is a mistake, but it's more difficult to explain why. So for example, uh, you're, you're Joe Friday, man. I haven't seen the series, although now I'm going to go. And, oh, you'll love it. You'll love yeah. it. <laughs> um, but I think, I think that the one of the big, biggest preconceptions we have today, and this this goes not just for uh, you know people at large, but rather also a, a large segment of the philosophical community, is that there's this notion that thanks to the empiricist tendencies in our culture that uh, facts or seeing facts consists in taking a look. Um, 
just sort of empirically observing. If something can't be observed um, empirically, it's it's not classifiable as a fact. Um, this probably explains the the hugely popular logical positivist movement when it in its heyday in the sixties, um, which tried to reduce everything to that, <clears throat> and out of which emotivism grew. By the way, so. But on the other hand, uh, as, you, as you point out, uh, what does it mean to approach the facts? It seems that you always come prepared with a theory. Uh, why are you questioning the facts the way you are? Because probably you have, a, as you said, a hypothesis or a theory that you want, that you're going to bring into play. So already the plot thickens in some ways, right? The, there is no such thing as just pure facts apart from a way of understanding, interpreting, and judging the facts. Now, if I'm right in saying that, then it, it seems to open up other possibilities. You don't have to just capitulate to a, a rigid separation between facts and values. Um, could it be the case that things could be factual and yet not empirically observable? I don't see any contradiction in saying those, those things. Um, and so, for example, if you have somebody like von Hildebrand or even Max Scheller, who, who was... Um, uh, another originator of, of this sort of phenomenological realism, um, they would have no uh, qualms about maintaining that there's a level of experience which puts us in touch with objective facts. In fact, I, I think that they would they would see that position as, as an open challenge to the complacency of this fact value distinction that I mentioned. Um, and if somebody, but you can see it almost already, somebody would could easily challenge that and say, well, you know, you claim that there are these facts of the matter, these valuational facts of the matter, but I don't see any. Well, of course, if you're going to approach it from this sort of empiricist mindset, then then clearly observing a value is not the same thing as observing whether it's raining outside. But does that mean that it's not a fact? Obviously, it depends very much on, on what your theoretical background is. What are the assumptions you bring to that situation? And, uh, but already in saying this, uh, we're well beyond just a sort of a complacent assumption of the fact value distinction, I, I think, um, which is a good thing. I, I think it, it deserves to be questioned. I'm not sure if I really answered your question. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure that the question was discreet enough to be uh, readily answered, but but Mario, you you push us ahead, okay? Well, I I think you are touching a very difficult question. Uh, let me tell you what is happening now, and you know because probably you are paying too much for gas prices. But the phenomenon of inflation is everywhere. Everywhere, not only in California, everywhere. In Latin America, is a disaster. Okay. Now, yesterday, precisely, I was watching a program from Argentina. The discussion about it was inflation. And one of the journalists there was claiming that inflation is a fact a mathematical fact you can measure. And so how then you see the uh, uh, percentage inflation? Well, when you go to the supermarket and buy product, there is no question about the prices are going up. And the reason why that is happening, he gave a lot of explanation about uh, monetary policy and so on. And so come the other side and said, well, but I can give you another view about how to go about and look at this fact. Now, that fit in what you are saying. What is factual there is being interpreted according to their theory about what the economic phenomenon is. And so they bring the theory and then read the fact accordingly or according to that view. Now, <clears throat> I'm not an economist, 
And the only thing that I know is I go to the supermarket, I go to buy a gas, it's very expensive. Now, if that is a way of understanding this nociology, the theory of knowledge, wouldn't be then falling into different worldviews that ultimately there is no way of understanding really what is happening here. And everything at the end is just an ideological struggle. I say this is what I understand by inflation. You say this. Like I heard the other day, I think the Secretary of um, Treasury say, well, perhaps it's abortion which is causing uh, inflation or something of that sort. And so how then you address this? Uh, how would you address this uh, conundrum, if you will? So... Uh, neither am I an economist, first of all, be it noted. <laughs> um, however, uh, the economics is a social science. And uh, as, as you know, there's more than a little controversy surrounding the status of social sciences. What exactly are they doing? They, they, don't, they cannot just be another hard science like physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. Let, let me, I, I, I don't want to interrupt you. Right there, there was a difference. Because many people would say it's not a social science. It's well, a mathematical science. It's just there. There's nothing about economics that resemble any other social science. I'm saying one school of uh, economists claim that. Well, I, I, honestly, I, I would love it if that school you mentioned were correct because then we could figure out when the next recession was and we could predict the market and we wouldn't lose our houses. Um, but as, as you know, uh, it's very much about human behavior. How do, behave, how do people behave in risky situations and so on? Uh, they rush for security. Uh, you know, prices, inflation are, are not only a question that the, the model of uh, supply and demand is a little over, overly simplistic. It, it's also perceived supply, supply and demand people's psychological reactions to situations is as much a factor in economics as the mathematical part. And uh, I would love it if it was reducible to mathematics. I think it would help us all a lot. I, so I, I, I suppose I, I am, again, I'm not an economist, but it seems curious thing to deny that it's a social science. At least it has one foot in the world of the social sciences. Maybe it's not quite as much a social science as say psychology or sociology, but it seems that human behavior is a large part of it, unless I'm mistaken here. But I, I only mention that um, because uh, it, it seems to me that the social sciences themselves, and, and here let's take your example of economics, they often get into trouble precisely, uh, it, again, in my opinion, based on this faulty fact value distinction. So for example, um, there was a, a case, I'm not sure if you remember, I, I want to say it was around um, 2008, 2009. There, there was some issue with the airlines. I think a volcano had blown up somewhere in, I want to say Iceland, but I can't quite recall. Mm -hmm. But as, as a result of all the gunk in the air, uh, they had to cancel an awful lot of flights. People were stuck in airports across the world. And there were shocking stories coming out of these places, out of these airports about vendors and 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 merchants uh you know hiking up the price to, to ridiculous levels people weren't able to afford bottled water even uh families stranded at these airports um and and when some of these vendors were interviewed they they said it, it's just uh, it's the the facts of economics it, it's the law of supply and demand as though uh, the law of supply and demand were just one more fact we didn't make this it's just how it is. It, it's out there. When everybody knows full well that they made a decision to hike up the price. Um, so I, I mention this not to try to get uh, the world of business, only to ask for a little more transparency and honesty. You can't hide behind the fact value distinction. 
there is a distinction at some level between facts as we just find them out there and decisions we make. And I think that's not acknowledging that, at, at least at some level, is obfuscationist. I, I think that it, it doesn't lend clarity to things. And it may, in fact, um, enable certain negative patterns of behavior. A refusal to take responsibility for decisions. Uh, just say that it's the facts of the matter. Sure, it can be used as a dodge. So I'm not saying, I mean, you, you began there by saying this is a highly complicated issue. I, I agree. And I don't want you to think that I'm not trying to just listen to me, guys. I'll iron it all out for you. That's not what I'm saying. I, I'm just making some observations about a certain complacency, which seems to have settled into our mindsets about the fact value distinction. It's not that simple. And, and, and we should look more closely. All right. Point well taken. Now, uh, <clears throat> Mario says he's not an economist. And you say you're not an economist. <laughs> but uh, Christopher and I can up the ante. We're not even economical. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, <clears throat> while we're not economical, I, I will attribute this much to, to, to Christopher. He's metaphysical. Uh, and I'd call him a metaphysical animal. <laughs> Lord, Lord knows what he'd call me, but... That's, that's a compliment, right? Oh. <laughs> and uh, uh, let's ask that uh, Buckeye from Ohio what what his thoughts are now in our in our discussion which is very engaging and interesting well i guess I, i'm still unclear about what you mean by values <laughs> 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 i mean are you talking about moral judgments are you talking about uh, non-measurable judgments uh, judgments of the world that cannot be tested by empirical means what do you what do i what is, what is actually being what do you mean by values here what is the difference between a value and a fact i mean because if a, i can I, I think it would be a fact right that arsenic is bad for the system one might argue on another level that it's a fact that injustice is bad for the soul so but it would seem that if i'm understanding correctly the judgment that an unjust act whatever it be is bad for the soul is a value am i understanding these things correctly so 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 again um the, the fact value distinction it, it cannot it, it seems to bring with it a whole lot of metaphysical baggage um so as much as it is a prevailing opinion it doesn't follow that the reasoning behind that opinion is is clear at all i would say this um going back to i hate to play the historical card again but it seems to me unavoidable we, we got here from somewhere. And um, if, if we abandon uh, the Aristotelian framework, it's not just that we swap Aristotle for, for Descartes or however you want to write that. It, it's also that a, a certain way of thinking about who we are uh, went out the door. Um, so you drop the Aristotelian worldview and, and we no longer have an easy way of placing ourselves as human beings in the rest of nature. We seem to be the aberrations of nature. And a clear example of that would be Descartes, who finds himself forced to separate uh, physical things, extended things from, from ourselves as thinking things, and doesn't quite know how to put them together again. Um, so I think that it's correct to say that there are values which are, if you want, factual it seems to be the case for instance that if you act in certain ways uh you will be unhappy uh th th i mean that's about as factual as it can get and it may not be empirical in the sense of pure raw sense data but it seems to be part of reality mm -hmm. but, but notice that to say that you need a far more generous interpretation of what facts are uh, and one which refuses to separate human beings out from the rest of nature and and so i think one of the unfortunate legacies we've been given is is trying to figure out how we connect to nature 
in, instead of being, you know, part of the glory of nature, we've become, uh, well, without too much exaggeration, freaks of nature. Yeah, you know, raccoons have no values. We have values. Right? Yeah, that makes yeah. us odd yeah. and and set apart, which I don't think is a very helpful way of thinking about things. Right. The, uh, the second half <clears throat> of your article that so far shaped our discussion, Don Quixote meets Mr. Gradgrind, that's the first half. The second half is a neglected proof for immortality. Now, <clears throat> whether we're metaphysical or not, uh, animals die. And I wonder what you make of uh, then Carol Wojtyla, uh his observation in a, a collection of articles he wrote called person and community. His observation was that the imminent good of our actions, uh, actions not insofar as they affect the world around us, but actions insofar as they bear on who we are. He, he writes that not only do the traces of it, imminent good, not only do the traces of it that have remained in human culture themselves defy death, for they live on and re-enliven ever new men and women, but they also seem to call for immortality. So what we do, how we act insofar as it makes us to be who we are, uh, that perhaps even, he says, testifies to personal immortality, personal immortality of the human being. A any thoughts on that? I, I haven't actually read the work you mentioned. Um, I've read some of Wojtyla's other work. Um, in some ways, he's, he's an extraordinary individual, um, spanning the scholastic neo-scholasticism with the phenomenological tradition it's he was really a, a kind of a key figure in, in breaking down some of the um obstacles to clear thinking about these things um i for my perspective for what it's worth is is that um uh immortality is it's one of those threshold questions um and and, and this is not my term it's 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 a well known uh, term. One of those liminal situations where we we because it's such an ultimate issue, it, it seems that it's something we can't say anything really definitive about, at least from a purely rational perspective. And yet we can't stop talking about it because it's a live issue. So um, why would why would Voitura say what he said? Uh, and my my take on this is is that he he's doing something similar to what Aquinas did and, and Augustine before him, which is is look for a, a reason for his hope. Um, to to be ready to give a reason for your hope, I, I I believe this is what he's doing. And I can I can be more specific. If, for instance, you you take a hardcore empiricist attitude towards reality, you know, of the type that is behind the the fact value distinction. Uh, today, um, it seems that we're uh, to to quote Yeats, harnessed to dying animals. Uh, we're souls harnessed to dying animals, and and it's 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 going to be over pretty soon. And there's nothing. There's no. There are no fireworks. There's nothing spectacular about this. So, a contemporary materialist, somebody who believes that there's really nothing to us beyond um, very complicated lumps of matter uh, would look at your hope in immortality as wishful thinking at best. So, so then the question becomes, how would you respond to that? W would you say there's any basis in reality for our belief in immortality? And, you know, here's where I draw a parallel with Aquinas because Aquinas interestingly did not try to prove immortality per se. What he tried to do is prove the immateriality of the soul. In other words, he tried to argue that when you, when you look at our 
rational behavior, there are certain features of who we are don't seem to match the rest of the physical world. So I said a moment ago that we are part of the physical world. Well, yes, that's part of the Aristotelian uh, view of nature is that we're not set apart. But on the other hand, here Aquinas needs to say, well, in other ways, we are set apart. There, there are ways in which we operate as rational beings which don't seem to match the way that other physical beings behave. And so he uses that as a springboard to try to argue that whatever you say about our rational souls, uh, there seems to be good reason for suggesting that they don't just go the way of all physical things. They don't just fade into non-being. That's not going the whole theological hog. It's not saying very much about that, but that, that's his point, is that from a purely philosophical perspective, there is reason for that hope. It's not just a misrepresentation of reality or, or wishful thinking. And I see Voitura's efforts in this area. Uh, I believe that's what he's trying to do too, is to say this merits a second look um, because there are aspects of who we are as persons in the world that re require a different way of, of seeing things. Um, how do you explain the influence of a person's works, for example? If you write a book and you cease to exist, as it were, in this world, and I read your book and I feel like I get to know you, you've sort of left an imprint uh, on reality. Now, it may not be what they would think of as a hardcore empirical imprint, but nevertheless, there's something of you in that book. Um, and so I believe, to, to an extent, what he's trying to do is to open up the question beyond a sort of a reductive empiricism and, and look again at who we are. And, and that, of course, invites questions about uh, threshold questions, such as, is this all there is? A question that does not go away. Mario, what next? Well, um, a political question. Um, oh, no. So most of us are members of the American Solidarity Party, and we usually, or many uh, members, use natural law arguments about certain issues. What do you think about that? Do you think it's useful to do that? Or at this point in this culture, is just um, something that we need to abandon? Personally, I, I don't see any way around natural law theory. It, it, it seems, but having said that, um, I think it has to be acknowledged that the language in which it's couched is unintelligible to a lot of people. I think a lot of folks today would say, you seem to be speaking of a metaphysical worldview, which is no longer here. Mm -hmm. That's, in my opinion, that's too simplistic. I, one of the curious things is, is that natural law theory keeps coming back um, in the same way that questions about immortality keep coming back. Um, uh, you know, historically, I know I always go back to the history of it, but it's sometimes it's helpful. Um, during the Nuremberg trials, when Germ when a lot of German leaders were on were on trial, uh, the the legal representation for the German side claimed that they hadn't actually broken any laws, because, of course, the civil rights of Jews in Germany had been taken away, so. From a purely legal perspective, there was nothing, no part of the legal code at the time that they'd broken in Germany. Germany had also pulled out of international agreements. So their question was, if you're going to keep this legal, after all, it was supposed to be um, a respectable legal trial here, uh, exactly which law did we break? And, and this sent the Allied prosecution into a bit of a quarrel because they weren't quite sure how to respond to this, but they came up with a charge of crimes against humanity. And uh, this, this was in, in, in many ways a kind of a watershed moment because that looked like a distant cousin of natural law theory. Um, so I, I, I think that if you want to say certain things such as um, genocide is wrong, abortion is wrong, capital punishment is wrong, and so on and so forth. Um, 
you, you appeal to, it seems to me, some kind of common human framework. And if you can't do that, then it, it seems difficult to defend any kind of, I'm going to use the word, factual status to, to the values, any kind of objective status. It becomes merely a question of preference. So, so I, I, I don't think it's a waste of time to appeal to natural law theory, but I think that um, if you're going to use that as a tool, it needs to be a robust enough version to stand up to critique. Uh, I'm not sure if you, there was a, fa there was a, you know, recently, well, relatively recently, there was a debate between uh, Car then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger and Jurgen Habermas. Uh, and, and Habermas, strangely enough, a, a quasi neo Marxist, tried to find common ground with Ratzinger and he appealed to um, the natural light of reason and natural law. And, and strangely, Ratzinger's response was this concept's been ruined. It, it, it no longer does the heavy lifting that it was able to do before, which, which of course is, is, you know, Ratzinger is a scholar, and, and of course he's in many ways correct about that. The the metaphysical basis has kind of collapsed, but in a deeper sense, Habermas is right. I think because there's no way around natural law theory. If you don't have some basis, some agreed basis on who we are, then good luck finding any kind of moral code or any moral code that will go beyond your preference here and now. We don't like pauses, so Christopher. I'm sorry, I was coughing, so I didn't hear you. <laughs> thought I put somebody to sleep. <laughs> no, it was just a cough. Um, what was your question? I'm sorry, Jim. Well, uh, the, the discussion has shifted from uh, the empiricists versus those who would go beyond mere empiricism, while not overlooking, of course, that for human beings, our knowledge begins with uh, sense information, to uh, how do we dialogue with uh, people who are so very, very different from ourselves in philosophical orientation and in theological commitments. And uh, Mario's asking, and I'm asking, and uh, the American Solidarity Party, oh my gosh, is asking, what's the role for natural law? And uh, interestingly enough, uh, our, our guest, Professor Cummings, has written on this whole question with his pivot point, the discussion between Habermas and uh, Ratzinger about the extent to which uh, public debate can use the terms of natural law. And, uh, well, our, our guest says uh, you got to have a robust theory of natural law. Uh, but uh, even if you don't, it seems like we can't get away from it anyway. <laughs> it keeps popping back into play. And uh, of course, we in the American Solidarity Party, and don't mention the poisonous acronym ASP, we in the American Solidarity Party uh, 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 quixotically, rather than grand grindily, uh, in public debate appeals of natural law. So what, what are we going to do? What are we going to say? I mean, uh, Andrew, you're looking, when you look at Christopher, at our only, our only public official in the United States of America. He, he's our point man. So go ahead, Christopher. Well, okay. Yeah, I, I'm, the, I'm a village councilman for a, a village of 400 people. So it's it's a it's a lofty position, but I think I live in rural I live, I live in rural Ohio, and my my sense is, is that people naturally think in natural law terms, unless they're, they're unless sometimes their interests are involved, or um, then it, then they will start talking in majoritarian terms that what 
is preferable to the majority is what should guide us, not what is necessarily right and wrong. But in part, that's because where I live is, is still heavy, heavily religious. So I think the, the religion actually keeps that a certain um, modicum of natural law thinking in place. I, I, I've, I've often wondered um, to the degree, what, to what degree does religion actually is, is necessary for that kind of um, continuing natural law conviction? And to what, uh, to what degree do we have to evangelize first before we actually reason with people? So, you know, if you look at Aquinas' statement of natural law theory, um, you know, it's defined, I hope I get the wording right, but as, as the human participation in the eternal law. So it's clear that Aquinas has a metaphysical basis for this, which is ultimately theological. But I think that the use to which natural law theory was, was put um, in, in, in centuries that followed, um, for example, in, in the discussion about the rights of Amerindians and, and so on, um, did not always uh, play the theological card or the religious card very heavily. Uh, it was an appeal, I think, especially to what was common to human nature. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know that it's, it's always necessary to play the religious, the theological card. I think as, as Christians or as Catholic Christians, um, we'd want to eventually say something about that to, you know, square it with the, the overall teachings of the faith. But I think that in dialogue with others, I don't know if there's always a need to bring in the theological side of things. A good example for me would be um, uh, take, take a poor old Jacques Maritain, um, a French Thomist, uh, he, he found himself in the curious position of defending human rights in, in, in the modern conception. And when he was asked how he could square that with the Thomistic teaching on natural law theory, he, he offered a defense which essentially said that if it turns out that the rights to certain things, such as uh, basic sanitation, uh, freedom, education, this kind of thing, um, if it turns out that access to, to those things in human life is what makes possible the following out of principles of the natural law theory, then to that extent, uh, we can embrace them. And, and I just, I found that interesting because essentially he was saying that we don't need to bring out the heavy guns of scholastic natural law theology in order to embrace the best of what's being offered in, in a contemporary sense. But again, you know, that has its perils because um who's to say uh, what we put on the list of human rights um is there any limit to it and so it, it's not a uh, natural law theory is, is never a magic wand you can wave at situations but i i find that it's it's uh without some sense of the natural law theory or at least a version thereof uh we got nothing right I agree with that. I don't mean to say that we should use religion in arguing for natural law, but it almost seems it's almost a precondition for people to actually um, accept natural law, at least, at least um, the natural law in its, full, in its fuller elaborations, right? Um, do good and avoid evil is pretty much everyone will agree with. But when we get beyond, start getting into more complex questions, um, it becomes much more difficult to determine what the natural law is. This is true, but but on the other hand, um, take take one that's it, it's neither a high level application, but it's not quite the bottom line: do good, avoid evil, either right. uh, protect human life. Um, almost every sane person is on board. Uh, th there's a sort of a visceral gut reaction to shameless taking of human life, uh, especially innocent uh, lives. Um, you can almost count on that. And, and so I, I find it interesting that the natural law theory, even in the, in, in the traditional sense, would, would fully, uh, obviously f fully in, endorse that, but not necessarily bringing in the theological card. I, I guess my worry is that 
if you bring in the theological case up front, you could lose half your audience. Um, effectively to dialogue, I, I feel like you almost have to um, put that card to the bottom of the deck. Um, it'll out eventually, but uh, yeah. Just one uh, issue that you touch. Um, I think it's very interesting because in the discussion Abermas with uh, Ratzinger, they began with the starting point, which was the mention of a German Catholic a jurist, um, Bockenfarmer. And, Bokken Farmer. and and the, the claim was whether or not the constitutional liberal state, contemporary state, had a principle that itself cannot guarantee. Is there any principles there that we cannot guarantee from which we can start and begin what we call the rule of law? And so, the, and both said, yes, we need that. The question then reside in how then we go about and find that principle. Now, in that area, both disagree, I think, because the idea was whether or not democracy has epistemic capacity to understand metaphysical principles. And so, well, you can go there and the communicate uh, reason of. Uh, Habermas, and he gives his uh, Kantian account, and then Rasinger. But ultimately, the agreement between the two is very modest. At least we understand that we can engage in a dialogue. Now, non they don't start from say, claiming those uh, bold claim about natural law rather than whether there is a foundation about this state that we talk about today. And so perhaps that is the, the situation of that dialogue. Now, however, having said that, in our contemporary conversation, we not even start from that question because some people assume that there is no such a thing as any principle. Um, in that sense, I think Averman is a, a very good, uh, um, is very helpful. That's a side comment, a run, or whatever you want to call it. Well, you could say, I mean, my recollection, I think this book was translated as the dialectics of secularization. Um, but I, I always looked at this, this conversation as being about the glue that holds society together, especially liberal, modern liberal democratic societies. And um, uh, you could say maybe that that's the Achilles heel of liberal democracies is um, why should I listen to you if you disagree with me? Um, and I think Habermas at the end of the day was appealing to this, uh, you know, the communicative reason is one of Habermas's buzzwords, uh, you know, phrases. Um, but essentially he's hoping that we'll have enough at stake in a society to talk to each other constructively. Yes. And, and so I, 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 I think your point is, is, is right on. Um, that we're not always seeing that today. And, and, and if you look at the political commentary, uh, which is just out there floating around, uh, political scientists, political philosophers, and, and so on, one of the main things they're worried about is the disappearing of the conversation. Because at least as long as we sit down and talk, right. there's, there's hope, right? But, but right. If, 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 if I'm only thinking about how I can, what's the phrase now, double down on a position, right. And, and shout you down, then then I think at that point, the society is in real danger. Right. Thank you. That brings me to, uh, go, I'm sorry, Mario, go ahead. No, 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 thank you, I'm just saying. Thank you. Th that brings me to uh, really the last question that I'd like to pose. Uh, 
what what projects are you working on now and maybe especially what projects are you working on that might advance uh, uh, public uh, discussion of the, the many issues that we've explored? Well, uh, <laughs> the, the, the advancing public discussion part, um, at least one of my projects might not be much use for that. I, I'm, I'm writing something, I'm working on something uh, about German romanticism um, because I, the romantic movement in general, but especially in philosophy, uh, in, in my opinion, is is a very useful key to understanding where we are today. You know, this this uh, fact value distinction, subjectivism, if you want, um, emot emotivism, and perhaps even um, the the dominant theme of uh, life as uh, a voyage of self discovery. All of these concepts um, have their roots in, in romanticism. So I I'm looking at that historically and trying to um, explore some of some of the concepts and, and how this got started and took on such a life of its own but i'm also trying to work on um a sort of a an introduction for seminarians to um the study of philosophy i i, I think that uh going back to the opening of our conversation uh a lot of the guys here they, they bring with them unhelpful prejudices um, which I'd, I'd like to challenge at the beginning to sort of open up the discussion. One of them goes back to uh, what we talked about, uh, you know, materialism, th this attitude towards the world, that, which sees things reductively. Um, that can be an obstacle. I'd like to talk about that in, in one of my projects, but also political philosophy. In, in many ways, scientism and an un unhinged political thinking are, are two of the obstacles to... I think effective philosophical education, especially for seminarians. Um, I, I, I like to use Kant's phrase, you know, uh, what, what can I know? What should I do? What may I hope for? Uh, well, the, the last one, the hope part is pretty much covered, but the other two are, are not always very well thought through. And so I, I'd, I'd like, I'm, I'm hoping to address that. Ambitious and necessary. Let me put in a quick plug for a book for seminarians written by another uh, seminary prof, Jim Jacobs, at uh, Notre Dame Seminary. Uh, the Splendor of Wisdom, The Splendor of Wisdom, just out from Catholic University of America Press. And with regard to German Romanticism, you should know that our own Christopher Zender has written novels which purport to show that Germans can be romantic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if there's an element of Don Quixote in that or, or not, but <laughs> uh, on, on a much more important note we end as we always do with the, the gospel for the day this is from Matthew Jesus said to his disciples take care not to perform righteous deeds in order that people may see them otherwise you will have no recompense from your heavenly father when you give alms do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets to win the praise of others. Amen, I say to you, they have received the reward, but when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your almsgiving may be secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners so that others may see them. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door and pray to your father in secret. And your father who sees in secret will repay you. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. They neglect their appearance so that they may appear to others to be fasting. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. 
But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not appear to others to be fasting except your father who is hidden. And your father who sees what is hidden will repay you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.